we do bring him on here. Shane asked roll to start video, and then we'll ask him to unmute there. Mr. Jewel Block. There he is. Hi, how are you, man? I am doing great, man. How about yourself? I love that uh, that business card thing. You know, when I when I I, I kind of jumped in here in the middle, but I want to I want to study that. I'm looking at it, you know, and uh, well, it, it's it, a pretty it, inexpensive one too because I've seen the, some that are a lot more. Well, it's a complete answer to what we were talking about the other day. You know, with Mobit and stuff like that. That's a, a direct answer for you because you can put anything on there. Uh, like we talked about your slides and stuff like that uh, the other day. That's yeah, you know what? You and I are going to have to discuss that and come up with some kind of a high tech digital killer strategy, and and then we'll then we can share it with everybody else. But uh, I think it's going to take uh, that's that's a cup that's a couple beer discussion right there. You know, to me, you know, it's it's it, we got a little business we got to do together. That's a couple beers and a good cigar, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it or, or or a beef rib. I, those ribs, man. They, uh, you know, Woo. tell me about that. Jeez. You know, for those that don't know, one of the things I love I like to do is cook. I don't eat a lot of red meat anymore, and I'm sitting here at home one night, and uh, you know, popped up on Netflix is barbecue with uh, Franklin's. And here in Austin, Texas, we have Franklin's Barbecue. Uh, Anthony Franklin is is well known throughout the country. Latest PBS series about barbecue, and he did a session like on barbecue and brisket and ribs and pulled pork and chicken and the, the pits and so i streamed it all one night and i'm like man those ribs look really good those plate ribs and then regular rack of ribs and so last sunday steph can verify this like at noon i'm like i'm gonna give it a try i don't eat a lot of red meat anymore so i'm gonna give it a try so sure enough went out there spent all afternoon barbecuing ribs and oh my god the plate ribs like a brisket on a stick with the ribs and then that rack of ribs that i shared whoo a little sauce on it. it you know, it Scott, the, the reason that we get along, your hobby is cooking. My hobby is eating. And so it's, it's a, it's like a, it's like a glove and a hand in a glove situation. That's right. And baseball as well as baseball, you know, yeah, going to the Dodger game tonight. Matter of fact, there you go. Well, you know, we won't hold it against it. I think the giants are still in first place. Uh, Scott, you know, I, I'll tell you, we, we sure threw away a great opportunity this, uh, this week to uh, pick up a couple games and didn't happen. So. Yeah. So those that don't know, Joel's out of LA, a big, big Dodger fan. So kudos to the Dodgers winning the World Series this last year. It was great stuff for him. Uh, I love the eye patch. The Dodger eye patch was awesome being a Dodger pirate there for you. Uh, you are, you know, when it comes down to things, I mean, got to love baseball, got to love having fun. And it's one of the great things I think you do so well, Joel, is uh, uh, you love having fun and you're great at what you do. You really have helped so many, kind of transition a little bit here, so many investors take their business and what they're doing, take it to a whole nother level. I mean, you've helped what over 150, 200 people start funds. You're helping us with our fund. Yeah. You know, we, we've, uh, we've, you know, our program has spawned hundreds of funds and syndications. And, and all I can tell you is we've made a lot of people rich. I mean, I mean, it's, listen, it's, it's, um, it's one thing to learn the basic real estate skills is one thing to learn the basic note skills, but then at some point in time, everybody kind of wakes up and realizes you know, I just don't have the money to, you know, to, to, you know, I don't really have the money to get a lot of inertia so that you're, you're still kind of limping along. And at some point you say, I've learned all these great skills. I know how to do all this stuff. And if somebody would just put a little gas in my car, I got this beautiful car, the car would move and, and the money in business, the money is the gas. And if you don't pour some gas in the engine uh, now, of course, if you don't have a car and if you can't, you know, if you don't have the basic skills, uh, then I can't help you. That's, you know, Scott's going to help you. And, and that's that. But, uh, you know, once you've kind of got the the basics, you know, Scott, so this is for your people who are a little further along. This is not for your people that are contemplating leaving a job because they're, right. you know, this is a little bit more of an advanced maneuver. Uh, and, 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 you know, in full disclosure, you're in the process of developing your own fund uh, for exactly this reason. So, uh, you know, I mean, you're a guy who if, if somebody gave you a big, big, you know, vat of gasoline, you could you could pour it in the engine and make it work. So uh, we're going to just going to share what Wall Street does. And uh, because who makes all the money? It's the guys on Wall Street, right? That's right. We need it. We need to think from a Main Street mindset to a Wall Street mindset. You know, we've used the term from going from Wall Street investing to Main Street investing. Well, you got to think if you want to do some big things, you got to have a Wall Street mindset. And that's uh, one of the things that you do such a great job. And I've. Uh, absolutely love uh your education love what you share and helping people really take those baby steps and understand things and, and 
make it because it can seem uh, kind of big, like, oh my God, that's a big elephant I got to eat. And you break it down and really have shown so many investors how to be successful and doing, putting that big gas together to go do some big things. You know, there. listen, every, everything is, everything looks terrible looking forward. But when you, you know, but when you get there, you know, you, you look back and, uh, you know, I, I recently, as you know, I recently lost the vision in one of my eyes. And, and I literally, I was bumping into walls. I tripped and fell down, hurt myself. And, you know, and, and, and I wear a patch uh, most of the time on the side. If, or, you know, when, when I'm on camera like this, I, I don't. But I've kind of been embracing the patch, you know, more and more. So, uh, but, you know, but here's the thing is that I was terrified. Well, you were all locked up in the pandemic. I was terrified to leave my house because I would trip and fall because you can't see depth of field and I can't see cracks in the sidewalk. And, and I just one day woke up and I realized, you know, I just have to do it. I, whether I like it or not, I just have to do it. And, and I, uh, I went out and I walked, there's a little, little blocker in my neighborhood, four tenths of four tenths you know, of a mile. And I just did it. And I did it every day for a month, every single day. I mean, I, I just forced myself. I, I didn't want to. And then I went to eight tenths and then I went to a mile and a half. And now I'm up to two and a half, you know, where I just, I'm just out walking it in and, you know, it's helped me lose weight. Uh, it's helped me more, be more healthy, but, you know, but here's, what's interesting is I looked at the, uh, I keep a, a little thing. I push a button every time on my phone when I leave and, and then it tracks all my stuff, gives me all these stats, which I love to look at, but I wouldn't like to, to keep, right? <laughs> but I looked at them and, and what I noticed is that my speed got faster. So my, my distance got further, my speed got faster. And if I was, uh, if somebody would have said, okay, Joel, your goal is to get to two and a half. I thought, oh, no, no possible way. I can't do it. All I can do, I can, I'm afraid to go four tenths, but you know what, uh, if you just one eat the elephant one bite at a time, like like those ribs that you're supposed to invite me over for, <laughs> you know, if I just eat it one bite at a time, next thing you know, the whole friggin' plate's going to be gone and there won't be any left for Scott and his wife. <laughs> it's like a plate of Dodger dogs. <laughs> you know, I'm not a big fan of eating Dodger dogs, but, uh, you know, but but ribs, uh, you know, step aside, I'm going to show you how it's done. There you, there you go. We'll have to do it again sometime soon. We're both in the same town, definitely, because I don't think they would do well shipping them out to you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out exactly. So, Joel, you've got, I think you've got a bit of presentation, then we'll take some Q&A and, and, and uh, go from there, I think is what we decided yeah. to do. You know, you right know what I kind of like, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the screen, I'm going to make a presentation, I'm going to show some things, I'm going to kind of teach people uh, about uh, about how the money works, why why the Wall Street guys make a lot more money than other people make, and I'm going to show you how, uh, how some of the secrets work. And uh, you've been through our symposium, which is the, the full three-day shebang where I go through this. You've been through this now twice, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and you, you know, I'd like you to provide a little bit of commentary along the way. If you know, So feel free to jump in uh, if you think something is difficult or, or needs to be explained, because, um, you know, this is a different way of thinking. I mean, it is a different way of thinking. You know, when you're 14 or 15 years old and you're thinking about driving a car, you might be nervous. And, and, you know, you might uh, you'd be worried about it. But, you know, the truth is you, you take a class, you learn, then you go out and you practice. And by the time you're 16 or 17, after you get your driver's license, you're, you're driving along, listening to music, shaving in the car, you know, uh, you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, but, you know, it becomes second nature. Right. And, and that's kind of how this is. It may seem hard at first, but, you know, once you catch on, uh, this is the way that money, that money moves in the United States of America. And... Uh, if you want to control some things, if you want to make money, if you want to leave a legacy, if you want to do great things, and uh, you know, and and one of the things I'll tell you, the world needs you to be rich. It needs you to be rich because let me tell you something: poor people uh, just can't do big things. Uh, we can we can say all the nice things we want about all the things people can try and do, but the truth is, people that have a lot of money can do a lot of stuff, and you know, and so I'd like to help uh, you know people do that and. Uh, in, in fact, in the chat, uh, if you're somebody that is kind of at a, a more accelerated level, you know, write the word accelerated. I'd like, I'd like to see who's at a more accelerated level, uh, because I would like you to be involved in this, be, uh, be very involved. And Scott, if you just keep an eye on the chat, if people ask yep. questions, feel free to stop me and, uh, you know, we'll make it happen. Okay. Sounds good, bud. Yeah. We've got a few people watching online, actually on YouTube. But yeah. Well, people. you know. Uh, as, best, as best you can, whatever whatever we have to do. So I'm going to, let me share the screen here. 
Cool. And I'm going to turn my camera off, but I'll be here and you can jump in as, as things pop up. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's just awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, you all see the screen here, I imagine, right, Scott? Yep. All good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the bottom line is that, uh, you know, when you're first getting started and this applies to both real estate uh, notes, it applies to everything. Um, you know, you're using hard money, private money, you know, you're kind of using the worst money that there is because uh, when you're a beginner, uh, that's what it is. But as you get better, you get access to better money. So what is better money? I mean, better money is uh, it has better terms. It has better pricing. It gives you more control. Uh, there's less people that are, you know, going to get in your business and they're going to not be looking over your shoulder as much. And as you prove that you are, uh, you know, worthy of being able to control the money, uh, you're going to be uh, invited to have better money at a lower price with better terms, less uh, oversight and all the other stuff. And that's really kind of the goal. That's what we want. So we just have come through <coughs> the biggest crisis <coughs> probably in our lifetimes. I mean, there was a financial crisis uh, 10 or 12 years ago, but what we just dealt with was absolutely catastrophic. Uh, companies went out of business that were perfectly healthy, uh, but they just, you know, when you don't have any money come in for a year, uh, you, you uh, don't, uh, you know, you don't do good and you frequently go out of business. So uh, companies lost their leases. They went out of business. They closed stores. They had to put themselves on the auction block and sell themselves. And, and crisis, therefore, is the mother of opportunity. When there's a crisis, uh, there are always opportunities. And right now is a time when there is a lot of opportunity. And uh, every year we produce a trend report, my office does, uh, and we provide uh, advisory services to large companies. Uh, we tell them how to predict their future. We, we help them to plan for their future by looking at trends and things that are happening. And remember that I've been in the hedge fund and the venture capital business for most of my career, 30 years, uh, raising uh, money from investors. And, and I run a, a, a mastermind of hedge fund managers, people that have pools of money that go out and buy assets. And part of, uh, part of what we talk about in the mastermind is, hey, guys, this is what I'm seeing because I'm, I'm the one that's kind of looking at the big picture. They're all busy running their funds, uh, although I have a fund too. And, uh, but what they're mostly worried about is, is looking at their, their details. And I'm telling them what kinds of assets we should be thinking about going forward and who's having problems and what the issues are. And that's really this opportunity. Uh, there's a little bit uh, more equity in the marketplace than there was uh, 10 or 12 years ago. But banks are still taking back uh, notes, they're taking back uh, real estate, they're taking back all kinds of assets, uh, because people just in an instant ran out of money. So there are new opportunities that are uh, happening every single day. And the only way you can be ready to take advantage of an opportunity is to have a pool of capital that enables you to uh, take advantage of that. And if you, don't, uh, if you don't prepare yourself, then you just have no way of making that happen. So uh, if you're going to take advantage of the crisis, if you're going to take advantage of the opportunities, then you need to uh, think about uh, putting together a pool and being ready to strike when the iron's hot. And if you don't do that, uh, you won't have that level of success that you're hoping for. And by the way, if you're not ready, if you don't have any money, uh, if you're not ready, don't bother. Because all you're going to do is embarrass yourself when you go into the marketplace. If you start negotiating deals uh, with the expectation that, well, if, if I get a great deal, money will come. Uh, I think you might be disappointed and eventually embarrassed and wreck some relationships uh, more than you think. So uh, if you're ready, I'm ready. And let's, uh, let's all move on together and make some stuff happen. So we're going to talk about the money business. Uh, syndication. Uh, syndication is really a word that it's not really even a legal word, but basically the way it's used, it, it just means to create a pool of investors. So you get this person to put in 25, that person puts in 75, this person puts in 100. So you got a pool of several people. There is really only one really good way to do that. And that's what we're going to talk about. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say to me, Joel, are, are any, any people, are they really familiar with syndication? Do they know what it is? I'm going to tell you that um, rich people, which is this is really how rich people invest, uh, for the most part, uh, wealthy people all know what this is. And when you come to them and you say, listen, I've got a deal and it's uh, we're going to put it into a into a pool or a fund or a syndication, 
uh, they know exactly what you're talking about. Now, they may not know the words, but you know when you talk about it as an investment, they know exactly what it is. Every attorney, every accountant, they all know what this is. And so it's a very easy thing to, uh, to understand. And by the way, just for reference, the uh, private placement business, and this is, this is what we're talking about, they're called private placements, which is a way of raising capital for a non-public company, that the private placement business is so big that it dwarfs the entire United States stock market. It's bigger than the whole stock market. So you're sitting thinking, I never even heard of this before. And how could it be bigger than the United States stock market? Well, guess what asset is held in these uh, private companies that are not public and registered on the stock market? It's almost all the real estate in the United States of America, almost all the private holdings of notes, almost all the films are made this way. Almost all the venture capital deals are done this way. So everything that isn't public, and by the way, guess who gets the best deals? Do you think it's the guys who do the private stuff before it goes public, or do you think the guys who do the public? It's not the public deals. The, the public deals are more seasoned, so there's a little bit less risk, but the people who make the big money are coming in early, and that's why rich people like it. They love coming into these deals early. It really works for them. So why do... Uh, why do the professionals make so much money? Why is it the guys on Wall Street make so much money? Is it because um, they're doing it our way? You know, if you're doing joint ventures or you're doing, uh, I don't know, whatever kind of deals you do. Um, if you're financing your properties through hard money, private money, joint ventures, uh, that is not how Wall Street does this. They're not calling us for advice saying, boy, you guys are doing so awesome. We want to learn how to do it your way. Uh, what they're doing is they're, they're doing it a different way. And that's the way that I want to show you. And that's what Scott and I have been doing together and, and so forth. So uh, let's think about how Wall Street does it. It's very simple. They take a building. Let's say it's the Empire State Building. Let's say it's a pool of notes. Uh, it could be a billion dollars. It could be $5 million. It could be uh, $500,000. It doesn't matter. You take 20 or 30 notes in a bucket. And, and let me promise you, when you buy a bucket of them and you're not cherry picking one at a time, you get a better deal. And... Uh, so they take that bucket and they slice it up like a loaf of bread, just said, and then they say, okay, we've got um, 20, uh, 20 slices of bread. Uh, how many slices do you want? Each slice is a share of stock. And basically the investors say, well, I'll take two shares. This one says, I'll take four shares. That one says, I'll take six. And this one says, I'll take one. And now all the, all the slices of the bread are gone. And you say, okay, great, we're done. Now I got all my money. I got the million dollars that I need to buy whatever I'm buying. And you've done uh, what you're supposed to do. You've sliced your deal into shares of stock. And that's what Wall Street is so good at. And that's what we're going to uh, talk about right now. So how do you slice real estate into shares of stock? How does it happen? First thing you do is you form an LLC. And then all deals are 95% done the same way. You form the LLC and then you sell or you crowdfund the shares to all the people you want. So that means that you call on people that you know and you say, hey, listen, I've got a deal. We're buying a pool of notes. It's a distressed uh, package. We're getting it at a substantial discount because we're buying a bunch of stuff all at one time. And uh, would you like to invest in the deal? Because here's what we're going to do. We're going to rehabilitate the notes and we're going to sell them off. And we should be able to make X percent over a period of time. And uh, you know, we're basically going to all share the profits. You know, now you're going to get an extra share for being the promoter and you're going to get some fees for the things that you do, but the investors are going to get a good return. And let me promise you, the return that they're going to get is not going to get, uh, they're not going to get the 1% that they get at the bank or the 2% that they get on a bond or the 3% that they get in the stock market. They're, they're going to get something much more substantial from you, which is why wealthy people like these kind of deals. Uh, it doesn't preclude... Uh, regular people, people who aren't wealthy, uh, wealthy people are called accredited, not wealthy people are typically called non-accredited, and there are some rules around that. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that non-accredited can't participate at all, but, uh, you know, but there may be some limitations on that. And that's, you know, of course, it's reasonable if the government says, hey, if we're not going to regulate it and keep an eye on it, then we're not going to let you, uh, you know, just sell the shares to anybody in town because you could take advantage of them. So, they want to kind of keep it uh, a little bit uh, close. So we're going to sell the shares to uh, many people. We're going to you know, sell them uh, these uh, slices of the loaf of bread. And then we're going to elect a president. Now, uh, if you're the one that's slicing up the loaf of bread, 
and you're the one that's going around looking for the money, who do you think that they would like to have be the president? Now, they're not going to say me. They're not going to say Scott. They're going to say you because you're the one they know. They want the person that they know to run the deal because they trust you and they think you're going to do a good job. And that's why they want to get involved with you in the first place is because they know that you could pull this off. So then once that happens, then you're going to probably have to hire a broker or some other representative to acquire the package of notes because uh, somebody has to represent the LLC. And if you're licensed to acquire notes or if you're licensed to make notes or whatever it is, or buy real estate or be a broker of some kind, uh, and the note business doesn't have as quite as many restrictions as the housing business because housing is a kind of a sacred thing in the United States where people live and you can't fool around with people's housing uh, too much. So uh, it's a little bit more closely regulated. Uh, you're going to probably hire a representative, but that representative can be paid a commission. And if that can, uh, person is you, you can be paid a commission as long as you properly disclose it in your paperwork to your investors. And that's, uh, that's part of how this all works is that the, uh, your fund is going to need uh, vendors. It's going to need people to handle its affairs. And if you're properly organized to do that, then you can be one of those vendors. So once you uh, hire the broker to acquire the notes, let's say from wherever it is, uh, then you're going to uh, put your notes into the, the LLC that you've just formed. So you form the LLC, you raise some money, you then take the money and you go buy the notes. And then, uh, you know, that's it. I mean, that's the bottom line is that you form the LLC, you sell some shares of stock. Once the money's in the pot, you go out and you buy whatever asset you want, real estate, make a film, uh, you know, buy a yacht, you know, with 20 people together, whatever you're going to do, that, this is, it all works the same way. Now, why go to all the trouble? Wouldn't it just be easier just to, you know, get a bunch of friends, put money in a bank account, and, you know, well, it would be easier, but it wouldn't be better. And keep in mind that the pros wouldn't do this if it wasn't better. Uh, you have to tell people what's going on. You have to make disclosures. That's why there has to be attorneys involved. And you have to tell them things. And if you're going to take fees or other things, you have to tell them. And if you're going to get an extra share for being the promoter, you have to tell people that in the documents. So whatever it is you want to do, you got to tell them. That's all. It's not uh, really the end of the world, but you got to tell them. And that's why you go to the trouble of doing this. So let's take a look at for the promoter, which is us, the people that are that are right here on this call with us now that uh, want to run these funds. Uh, why would we do this? What's in it for us that we would in fact do this? Number one, we have more control because once people uh, give you the money, they don't call you and they don't say, you know, uh, we don't really like how you're doing. We don't think that the uh, office furniture matches the carpet and the drapes. We don't like the color of the buildings. We don't like, you know, we don't like the bank you're working with. You know, those issues do not come up. That's not what we're uh, here talking about. So uh, the bottom line is that uh, you have more control. And that means that you're the one that gives authorization. Um, your money is ready, it's handy. And when your money is ready and handy and you can negotiate on the spot, that means you're gonna get better deals, better margins, and everything works kind of to your advantage. Uh, these deals are not exclusive, by the way, which means that uh, you may run a fund uh, and you're buying this over here, but then you decide, hey, you know what? There's something that's come up over here uh, and I wanna do that privately or with a couple of other people. And, and so I'm going to do that. And so that's something that you have flexibility about. There are no interest payments here. It's not, this is not like borrowing money from people and you have to make payments and you're you know, getting yourself into debt. Now, there, there is a mechanism where investors get paid before the promoter gets paid, but that's on a best efforts basis. And if there's not enough money to go around, then you hold that money back and you pay it on the next cycle. You know, So eventually the people will get paid. But if you're uh, not able to, able to do it right now, then you have some flexibility. And what that does is it reduces the amount of pressure on the syndicator so that you can do a better job. Your goal, of course, is to pay the investors, but you also want to make sure you're doing the best job and maximizing the value of your assets as best you can. Uh, the last part is that you get better pricing on your capital. I mean, you know, hard money is expensive, but this uh, this preferred equity that we're talking about is really uh, it's generally a pretty good uh, deal. And then you make uh, your money on a revenue octopus, which is your fees and all the other things. We're going to talk about this in a minute, but there are many different ways that promoters get paid. And so uh, the first way is that you get paid for being smart. And almost everybody always gets paid for being smart. We all, that's kind of what we're used to, get paid for being smart. You find something, price goes up, 
sell it, make a profit, you were smart. The problem is that you invested a lot of time to get to your uh, payoff. And because you weren't being paid for your time, the money that you got paid for being smart has to reimburse you for all the months that went by that you were busy uh, negotiating, organizing, re redeveloping, whatever you're doing, kicking out your tenants, buying back properties, whatever you're doing, all that money that you, uh, that you make is really reimbursing you for the time that you spent doing all the things. So uh, in the syndication business, the model we're talking about, uh, you're also being paid for your time. So uh, if you're a broker, you're being paid for brokerage. If you're negotiating, if you're foreclosing, whatever it is you're doing, you're being paid for those things so that when you get your bonus for being smart at the end and you make a profit, uh, that all goes to the bottom line. And that's why people build so much wealth in this business is because they're being paid for their time on the front end. And what's being smart is being paid on the back end after they've already gotten uh, paid for the front. And so all the money on the back goes right straight to the bottom line. And that's a really cool thing. So uh, when you talk about being paid for time, uh, you know, any payment to a third party, any, anybody that can take money from a third party, uh, that all that money is available to go to you. You just have to make sure that you properly disclose it, tell the story. And as long as you put that in your documents, you're going to be good to go. Um, if you uh, uh, generally uh, are able to stabilize the uh, cash flow of your notes and help your fund grow, uh, then uh, the fees for that will be uh, no problem. So we have a list of fees that uh, these are mostly uh, real estate fees. The, real, the fees for notes are, uh, are twice as long and they wouldn't fit on this page. But remember, the people who are in the note business get paid not only for the note fees, but they also might get the real estate fees. So there's really a lot of fees that are attached to this uh, because the people who are serv you have servicing the note, you might have interest rate spread, you might have brokerages. I mean, there's a lot of ways that people in notes get paid. But then if something forecloses and then it becomes a real estate owned property, uh, then you have to have all the real estate fees in place too because you end up uh, potentially in the real estate business. So the note business kind of combines the two businesses together and you have to prepare for that. Um, and then how do you get paid for being smart? Smart means participation in cash flow. It means participation in back end profits. It means uh, you know taking, uh, taking participation in all of the revenue and the profit that you help create. And by the way, uh, you want to calculate that before you uh, share the money with your investors. So you're not subtracting interest. Like when you do a hard money loan, you subtract the interest first, and then you divide up the profits and there's hardly anything left. This, there's no uh, division of, uh, there's no interest that's allocated. So you get it right off the top. So you end up making a lot. And it, uh, that's kind of a, a little bit to bite off, but it's, uh, take my word for it. It's, it's the way it works. Um, my goal for you is to move you from the real estate of the note business into the money business. And then once you're in that money business, uh, the, the money's not made in the real estate, the money is made in the money. And that is a fact. Uh, people who are in this, uh, in the real estate business, the first thing that I try to do is I try to move you into the money business because people who are in the money business make a lot more money than people who are in the real estate business. And all the people who make a lot in real estate are really not in real estate, they're really in the money business. And that's what you got to think about too. So let's think about a wholesale deal. Let's say that you buy a note pool for uh, a million five. And let's say that you sell it, you flip it the next day for a million six. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but you know, I mean, I imagine a guy like Scott does that uh, and, he, and he picks up a clump of dough, uh, you know, overnight. Uh, it doesn't happen, you know, every day, but I'm sure it does happen. And he'll net a hundred grand. And that's fine. That's very exciting. It's something to be proud of. But let's take a look at what would happen in the situation of a fund and let's say the same exact thing. Let's just pull one property out and let's say it's a piece of real estate, not a note because a, a piece of real estate is a little easier to understand. So you, uh, you put the property under contract for a million five and, and you're, gonna, you're gonna own this property now for five years. This is a five-year plan. I'm gonna show you how much money you make in five years and kind of why this business adds up to be so, uh, so lucrative. Uh, you're going to take a, an acquisition fee of say 3%, which is a brokerage fee or an acquisition fee. That's 45,000 to you. You're probably going to help get some financing. There might be a point or two on 75% financing, another 22,000 bucks. And then you're probably going to get a property management override for a while. Uh, you may, do, may not do all the property management, which might be a 6% commission. 
but you may get a little override because you're involved in managing the property with the property management company. So that overrides worth another 20 grand over time. And then you're going to rehab the property. You'll probably take a project management fee, uh, which is uh, a common thing. And then you're going to participate in the cash flow that that property generates. That's another 80 grand. And uh, ultimately, you'll sell the property uh, some years later, say five years later, for uh, 2.4 million. And your profit, let's say, is 700,000. So uh, your share of those profits at 40% would be 280. And then you're going to get it back in brokerage. So you can see this is all the money that moves through this property. And it's uh, not out of the question. This is a very realistic kind of scenario. So how much money did you really make? Total uh, to you over five years is 539,000. And you're thinking, well, yeah, if I just did one of those flips every single year, but you know, number one, you don't make those things every single year. This is the kind of thing that you could do uh, multiple times every year. And most of our guys have two or three of those in the pipeline and they're doing them every single year. So you could see that they're making a lot of money uh, very quickly. It really adds up to be a lot. And the investors, by the way, in this deal where you're making a lot, they're also making about 12% a year. And let me promise you, when investors make 12% a year, they are very, very happy. Um, so you're thinking, well, gee, you know, are you making too much? If they were making 3%, you were making this much, that would be unfair. But when they're making 12%, uh, they don't really care all that much how much money you make because uh, it's fair on both sides. Both parties are making a lot. So, and, and if they complain too much, then maybe they're not the right people for you. And that's, uh, that's kind of an important concept. So hopefully, uh, you know, you're starting to get it. Scott, do you want to pipe in here and uh, bring anything up? No, I'd agree with you that, you know, it just makes total sense. And, you know, the uh, part of it is, I think the, the most attraction is so many people get into pitching. You got to start somewhere in real estate. And when you end up pitching individual deals and that gets old pretty fast uh, versus pitching the concept of what you're doing. And I think that's one of the most important things out there is now that you've like, okay, so it's pitching the deal. You've done the due diligence. You know, the deal works for you. Now you just got to go pull the cash out of the bank account that you've already sold people on your, your process and what you're doing. It, it makes it a whole lot streamed easier process. Plus, especially with what's going on right now, he who has the cash makes the rules and the, the ability to close quickly is going to lead to some amazing deals here for people over the next six to 12 months. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. Um, anything else you want to add or should we keep going? Keep going, man. You're doing good. Doing good. Uh, all right. Um, let me just, uh, you know, make a quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I am a CPA, but I'm not your CPA, so I can't really help you. Uh, and I'm not providing you with advice. It's just information. You have to get your own people to uh, help you uh, just because that's how it is. So here's my goal. My goal for you is to make this week different and better than next week. If I can help you make next week better because you learn how to do something and you learn how to solve a problem that you don't know how to solve, uh, then this will have been extremely successful. And that's really what our objective is. So uh, this program really, it says three, but there's really two sections. There's the uh, syndication basics. We just did that. And, uh, and now I want to tell you why funds get the best deals. And finally, we'll wrap up with some Q&A. So those are our three sections. So um, let's talk about why funds get the best deals. Number one, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm not making this up. I've spent a little time in the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, my finger, my, my, my knuckles have uh, some calluses from banging on doors. My ears cauliflower shape from having a foam press against it for all those years. Uh, you know, when I, when I was younger, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of that. Uh, not so much anymore, but that's, uh, that's what happened as I was younger. Um, about me, just in general, uh, I spent a couple of years at uh, the CPA firm Price Waterhouse. I counted ballots for the Academy Awards. That was kind of a fun thing. Uh, I started in the real estate syndication business. Uh, I left Pricewaterhouse and went into that business uh, and just started buying real estate, syndicating it. And then I started a venture capital company. I fell into a deal and I raised $10 million to uh, build a company, which I sold to a Fortune 500. And here's the interesting thing. Once you learn how to raise money for one thing, you can raise money for anything. So once I learned how to raise money in the real estate syndication business, when I stumbled onto this opportunity to get involved in this uh, media company, which I founded with another guy. Um, I knew exactly how to raise the money because I'd been doing it for four years. 
And that's why I was successful in raising $10 million. And if had I not raised that money, uh, that business would have never happened. And, and, and my life would be entirely different than it is now. And I basically, uh, you know, just worked on Wall Street, selling my services uh, for this financial facts uh, project that we did. Uh, and then after I sold that company, I went into venture mm -hmm. capital and uh, I spent many years buying and selling companies and, uh, you know, and all those things. And then about uh, seven years ago, I started my fund and I've been do running that now for a good long time. And uh, in our syndication program, which is kind of what we're talking about here. So let me just ask the question. Um, and maybe you could put something in the chat and maybe, uh, Scott, you could moderate the chat. Uh, if you think that the capital is more important, uh, you know, mark that down. Or do you think that the deal is more important? Mark that down. So in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, just put the word capital or deal. Which one is more important? Scott, how are we doing? Anybody uh, answer in there? Uh, they're typing in. I, I've got a few people typing in some questions. Uh, I've got a couple comments that capital on YouTube, capital from Jenny, the deal, David says, uh, capital says Norm, capital Frank says that, uh, let's see here, what else is there? John says a deal, uh, Norman says, I think they're both, <laughs> let's see here, RJ yeah. says capital, Wayne says capital. All right, good. Well, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say that there's a, uh, a right answer, but I'll tell you that to me, uh, there's only one answer. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, you know, when you go to one of these like real estate investment club groups or something, and they'll tell you, uh, you know, that uh, that the deal is more important because if you have a great deal, people are going to line up for your deal. But I'll also tell you that that is never true. It's almost never true because the people that have a great deal don't know how to get the money and they just hope that somebody will come to them. Hope is never a good strategy, by the way. I mean, it just is never a good plan that you hope something happens. Uh, when you have the money, deals materialize. They just do. And, uh, you know, and if I was to go to a real estate group, uh, if you went with me and you brought a great deal and you stood up and said, listen, guys, I got a smoking hot deal. Who wants to be in the deal? You know what happened? Nothing. Because everybody in the room has what they think is a smoking hot deal. But if I walked to the front of the room and I said, listen, I got a million bucks in, in my bank account. It's burning a hole in my pocket and I got to deploy it right away. You know what's going to happen? The meeting is going to stop. People are going to line up and start begging to talk to me right away because they're all going to be pitching me deals. And, and that tells you a lot about the uh, importance of capital in a transaction. So if you can learn to control capital, and I'm all about learning how to control capital. Uh, I had some people call me just this week, uh, guys that are fundraisers. Joel, we have a client that wants to do some different deals. And you know the most important thing about structuring the transaction I'm very concerned that they structure it in a way that will facilitate them raising the maximum amount of capital so that they're successful. And they were quite surprised about the kinds of questions that I asked because they weren't really questions about the deal. They're really questions about raising the money. And, and that really, when you're raising money, that's what matters is if you don't make your, your deal investor friendly, deal friendly, uh, if you don't kind of organize it in the right way, uh, you know, you're going to basically be throwing rocks in, the, in, your own, in your own path. And, and then you're going to create friction for yourself. You want to reduce as much friction as you can, because that's it. So um, I always like to ask people questions. You know, these Wall Street guys, these professional investors, the kind of people that I circulate with, are they 500 times smarter than everybody else? Because they make 500 times more money. I mean, so are they really 500 times smarter? Uh, I don't think they're 500 times smarter. Uh, but what I do know is that uh, there is a very specific reason why professional investors make more money in five days than most other people make in five years. I mean, there are very, very specific reasons. And we're going to get into some of those reasons. I'm going to share that with you. But part of it is because they understand deal structure. Uh, the structure of your deal is very important. It's kind of, I kind of think of it as like, um, you know, that little uh, three little piggy thing where, uh, you know, one built a house out of hay and one built a house out of sticks and the other out of bricks, uh, you know, and two of the structures fell apart and one structure was great and it, it worked for a long time. You got to get a great structure. And if you don't have a great structure, uh, then your deal is never going to work because a great structure provides a multiplier effect. And that's what you need. You're not getting a multiplier effect right now. In fact, you're getting a less than one to one effect because your structures are draining you. You know, my structure creates uh, this multiplier, but most other structures, uh, you know, are, are really poor. 
Uh, second, you got to have great market knowledge, uh, marketplace knowledge. And I assume you have that. You can't be in your business. You can't be good at your business if you don't have it. So you're going to absolutely need to have that. So you're, you got one of the things here, uh, enormous focus on what you do. Uh, you know, you're not bouncing from notes, bouncing into real estate, then doing apartments and then doing commercial and then doing a venture capital deal. And I mean, you're pretty focused on what you do and you're, you get really, really good at it. That doesn't mean you can't ever change, but you're not flip flopping around all the time. You know, you're doing something, you get really good at it. Then you may morph into something else. And that's, that's a good structure. And then finally, you're ready. I mean, these really people that we think are really smart that make a lot of dough, part of it is that they're just ready. I mean, they just know, uh, you know, when to pull the trigger. And then when they pull the trigger, they've got the resources behind them to, uh, to, to make good on their promises. And, and how, you know, how ready are you? When you go in the marketplace, uh, you know, is it your goal to tie up a deal and scramble around and look for the money? You know, I mean, that's okay if you have to do that, but we all start where we start. I mean, I do that when I first got started too. But, you know, as you get better at this, you kind of want to start planning so that that doesn't happen to you. And you really want to kind of get ready. So uh, one of the things that I always tell people, I, and I tell this to the biggest corporations and I tell it to individual uh, entrepreneurial people, is that when it comes to money, everything is rigged. Everything is rigged. Absolutely everything is rigged and there's nothing you can do about it. But you can know where the rig is. And the way that people rig the rules is by uh, writing the rules. And, and I want to show you how real estate is rigged because real estate is absolutely rigged in certain in certain ways and you need to know what those ways are and when you know what uh, the rig is then you can work around it so uh, there is a reason why uh, people who are ready professional investors make hundreds of times more money than everybody else and i'm going to tell you i mean here we're, we're i'm going to reveal this uh, momentarily and it will probably surprise you a little but when we're done with this, it's not going to surprise you at all because it's very obvious. Now, when I say rig, I'm not talking about anything illegal. I'm just saying that, you know, that the person who writes the rules rigs the rules. So, for example, when you go to Las Vegas and you have a green a zero and a double zero on the roulette wheel uh, and the odds are not even, the odds are in the favor of the house, that's not cheating. Uh, that's just the house advantage. But those rules are rigged in favor of the house. And we're all used to it. We just call it the house advantage. But in business, we don't expect it. We don't know that it's coming. Uh, but businesses are in the business of separating consumers from their cash. And, and we just have to be aware of it. So let's talk about how this works in the real estate note business and in the real estate business in general. I asked the question, why do funds get the best deals? Why? Why is it? that they get the best deals. Well, it's very obvious. Number one, my gun is always loaded. I am always ready. If I see a smoking hot deal, bang, I pull the trigger because I've got the money in the bank ready to go. And if my bank account is empty, I'm not out there shopping. I, I just, you know, I know what it is. And if I uh, do find something when I'm not quite ready, I know exactly how to get ready fast. I know exactly how to replenish uh, my resources and where to go and my structures are ready and everything that I need to take money in is ready. Let's take, let's look further. Um, uh, let's say that um, uh, brokers will move projects to us. There are no brokers, there are real estate brokers that have an idea about where the best deals are. Well, um, let's say that there are uh, two people, uh, you know, and this really happened to me. I was on an airplane next to a person and, uh, you know, I asked the guy what he was doing and, talked about real estate and it turns out the guy was an engineer and he said he was getting ready to buy a building and I said you know just for fun um, if there was a real estate broker uh, that had a smoking hot deal uh, who would he bring the smoking hot deal to you or me and the guy got really mad just like you know you're you're a snot you know you're you're arrogant you know why why wouldn't the broker bring it to me well here's why this chart is going to tell you why the broker will never bring deals to uh, somebody else except for the guy that runs the fund so number one, my gun is always loaded. I told you that already. But number two, who feeds that broker all year long? Who's given deals to that broker all year long? Who's given listings to that broker all year long? Who's buying from that broker all year long? It's not the other guy. It's probably me. Let's talk about next. My cash is ready. The broker knows my cash is ready. Uh, what's the story with the other guy? I don't know. He told me he had a couple hundred grand at uh, Merrill Lynch and he was going to uh, do some kind of a loan for the rest, you know, whatever the, the next hundreds of thousands or million dollars, whatever it was, 
Uh, my cash is ready. The broker knows that. Um, let's say the broker calls all the people and says, we're going to have a due diligence appointment. We're going to meet at the property and we're going to uh, examine it together. We're going to meet at the bank and we're going to examine the notes. Whatever, whatever we're going to do, we're going to do some diligence and examine it. And I've scheduled that appointment for four o'clock on Tuesday. And the uh, architect or the doctor, or the lawyer says, oh, no, sorry, I can't be there. I'm in surgery. I've got an appointment. I've got this problem. I got that problem. My calendar is always clear. This is what I do. This is why guys like me get the best deal. And this is why funds like you uh, will get the best deals too. So my schedule is clear. No problem with due diligence. Um, I don't have to borrow any money. I can go straight to the deal. That guy told me he only had a limited amount of cash. He had to borrow the rest. That means the it was going to take a long time. He didn't know how long it would take. A very complicated, uh, not smooth at all. Uh, the broker also knows, because we've dealt uh, together quite a lot of times, I'm going to respect his commission. And respecting his commission is an important thing. Uh, next thing is that we're in the network together. We, uh, we, we may play golf together. He may belong to the country club with me. We may hang out together, whatever it is that we do. And for those reasons, he's probably going to, uh, you know, treat me a little bit better. And finally, there's a thing called horse trading. And horse mm -hmm. trading means that uh, the broker calls me and he says, hey, Joel, you know, listen, I'm going to give you this smoking hot deal. But, you know, you've got that private equity friend. Uh, you know, do you think that there's any chance that three of us could go to dinner together and you could introduce me to him? Well, you know what? Uh, you know, you give me this really smoking hot deal and I'm happy to uh, have dinner with you guys. And so, uh, you know, we're not breaking any laws. We're not doing anything improper. But this is just how business happens in the United States. People uh, do business with people they like to do people that they that they know that they trust. They've already done business together. And that's why people with funds get the best deals. And this, uh, this may upset a few people, but it's the reality. It's the way things happen in the United States of America. So uh, ultimately, uh, we'll buy this property for, uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar, and we'll sell it to somebody else for 90 cents. And the person that sold it for 90 cents, you know, will try to sell it for some other price. But at the end of the day, because we're going to flip the thing in a, in a, couple, of, you know, in a couple of days, uh, and somebody else is going to hold it for a couple of years, we'll make more money than that person made uh, in a long time, probably overnight. And that's the reality of how notes work, is that when you've got the cash, you can flip, you can hold, you can rehabilitate, uh, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can use any strategy you want because you've got the cash and you've got the knowledge. And you know, having the knowledge doesn't really work if you don't have any cash. So you've got to get your cash and you got to be ready. All right. Um, Bottom line is, could you do more deals with more money? And I, I have to imagine that you could. Um, I've got a lot of information uh, you know, that, uh, that our firm publishes. We produce uh, enormous numbers of videos. Uh, we've got a giant library of videos and, and you can have all of those videos for free. Uh, I know Scott has watched a, a great number of videos. I don't have quite as many as Scott does, but uh, <laughs> ours tend to be, uh, they're, they're, they're we answer the questions that people write to us. So people, hey, Joel, what's the difference between a syndication and a fund? How do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, you can have all this stuff for free. Just uh, if you would take out your phone, uh, if you would do this right now, this would be helpful. And just uh, type in the, uh, the number 72,000 and then punch in the word asset. So message the word asset to the number uh, 72,000. And I'll, I'll wait a second while you do that. And our, uh, our system will register you and send you out the stuff. We don't uh, spam. You'll be invited to our symposium. You'll get our videos. I do a lot of media. I go on TV. I make a lot of predictions on TV. And uh, we usually publish those, uh, those interviews. And, uh, you know, again, Scott, I think Scott watches most of that stuff. So, Scott, uh, you want to you pipe in here at all? Yeah, it's great stuff, man. I mean, uh, as David said, uh, David's commented on here, David Staley said, uh, mind expanding, so mind expanding and that this guy's awesome. So yeah, Joel is awesome. He knows his shiznit and the stuff that you download here, guys, is, is really a lot of the amazing stuff that'll help educate you, get you rock and rolling. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's valuable information. That's all I can say for you. So text the word asset to 72,000. And you'll have access to the videos on there. So it's a great stuff, Joel, as always. Hey, let me, uh, let me answer some of the questions because uh, there are a few people that have written questions. Uh, somebody said, is, it, is there a state that's better to put your LLC in than another right. state? Uh, our experience is the best state is the state where you live because most states have some kind of, um, of rules that let's say you incorporate in Delaware and you live in California like I do. 
California still makes you register and pay the tax here. So we don't really get any benefit out of Delaware. So uh, most of the activity happens in, uh, in the state where you live. Um, any other questions here? Yeah, the uh, question online here is, what's a, a good starting amount? If somebody's trying to raise some capital for a fund, what's the uh, uh, minimum starting amount they should be looking at? You know, I would, I would tell you that um, this starts to make sense around three to $500,000. Uh, you know, less than that, it, it costs too much to set up. Even, even at three to 500,000, it's, it's a little bit heavy. The cost to set it up is a little heavy, but uh, you know, this is the thing about a fund is, you know, you, let's say you raise 500,000 this year, the next year you can raise another 500,000. Then the year after you can raise another 500,000. So you can keep growing your fund and you can have it for a long time and you don't have to rewrite all your documents. You just, uh, it just keeps growing. I mean, you have to do a little bit of work, but you have to, it's not like starting from scratch. So, um, you know, you can do sort of a modest thing. I, I try to, part of the reason we have so many successful people is you know, I don't let people, uh, you know, go out and try to raise 20 or 30 million because I know they won't be successful. I, I just know. I mean, I've been doing this for a long, long time. I have a very good sense of, I can talk to people. I have a good sense about their networks. And, uh, you know, Scott, I think you'll do better than other people because you've got a big following. I think you've got a, a little bit more uh, uh, gravitas than some other people. But, you know, for, for most people, uh, 300,000, 500,000, a million, that, that's a really, really good place to start. And you can do a lot with that. I mean, that's the beauty of it. You can still do a lot with a million dollars in, in buying assets these days, especially if you're, depending on where you're buying, Ohio, Michigan you know, some of the blue collar Midwest states, you can, still, you can buy a big portfolio or a, a good chunk of assets there that, that makes sense for you. Um, let's talk about the network. A fund is a great thing, but you still gotta, it's gotta have the crowd part of crowdfunding, right, Joel? Well, I mean, if you, you know, crowdfunding is, a specific, is kind of a technique, but you sort of do have to have a tribe. You have to have a following of people who think you're awesome, uh, who trust you, you know, so you have to be a trustable person. And, and they have to like you. They have to think that you're capable of succeeding. What are some of the, with the, just some of the different funds that you've helped launch? What are you, some of the, the successful things that you've seen people do to raise capital? Well, I'll tell you, that we, we've done several note funds. We've done several hard money funds where people are lending out a capital. We've done many different kinds of real estate funds, uh, you know, uh, apartments, shopping centers, commercial, industrial, student housing uh, you know there's there's some people that call just this week they want to they want to do a brewery nice. i mean you know now uh, that's a particularly interesting one and i think you know they want to raise 25 million and what i told them is i said you know they want to do crowdfunding i said okay look here's the thing save your crowdfunding for your second batch the first batch let's go get a couple million dollars to kind of get it going because it's going to take a lot of money the crowdfunding is actually more expensive than people realize but let's take uh, the first round. Let's kind of get some some initial traction, take some of that and then put it into the crowdfunding piece so that, you know, we can be successful. So there are strategies for parlaying one thing after the next. And, you know, we're not going to go into all those things right this minute, but I will tell you that uh, it is a really, uh, it's a very powerful, uh, it's a very powerful uh, plan. I mean, th there's no better way to raise money than this. I mean, it's, legally the best way, uh, according to the attorneys that I discuss it with. And it's, uh, it's something people are familiar with. I mean, put it like this. It's the biggest, it's bigger than the United States stock market. Every accountant does uh, tax returns with these, uh, with these tax, they're called K-1s, with these K-1s in them. Every attorney studied this in law school and is familiar with this. Uh, the Congress of the United States, they all invest in it, but they complain about it because, you know, it's, rich people get a tax break. Um, the, uh, the IRS doesn't like it, but the Supreme court of the United States has said it's legal and that you have to tolerate it. So, I mean, this is a fully legal, fully vetted at the highest level of the United States mechanism. I didn't make it up. Uh, I have kind of taken it to a, a little higher level than it was before, but I was exposed to this when I was doing tax work at Price Waterhouse, uh, 35 years ago. So, uh, I've been in this business a long time. This business has been very good to me. I'd like to see it be very good to a few other people. And I have to imagine there's a couple of people on this, uh, on this call that could probably uh, benefit from this. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're, uh, I mean, listen, again, like, you know, like I said at the beginning, Scott, if you're a beginner, then you got to learn the basics. You know, you kind of got to learn how to, uh, you know, build your car. You have to get your car somehow going. But when you're ready to put gasoline in the engine, you know, that's, that's what I help people do is I really help them to supercharge what it is that they're doing. Mm-hmm. So Scott, after you have helped people to kind of learn the basics about notes, when they're ready to, you know, really start buying uh, some notes, uh, th- this is what this does. So I recognize it's not for everyone, but the people that it's for, this is so friggin' exciting. You're not going to sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joel, could you talk a little about your uh, symposium? Let's yeah. Question about the hedge fund. No, so um, we've done it 25 times. It's a national program and people who are either buying real estate, notes, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, come to this program. And, and we, uh, we helped them. So, you know, it, it had been a live program, but, you know, the last two times has been on Zoom. Uh, we're not quite sure. We're doing it again in October. We're not quite sure if it's going to be in Las Vegas or on Zoom. That'll be a decision that uh, will be made soon. This new Delta thing has thrown a little bit of a wrinkle in the, uh, in the planning. Uh, and so, you know, we'll have to kind of decide a little bit, uh, you know, later. But uh, this program takes you from soup to nuts. I mean, it explains the whole thing. Scott, you've been through it twice. Yeah. You could probably comment on it, but it, it helps people to understand why you do it, how you do it, where the money is, how you share the money with the investors, what the investors get, how you sell the deal. I mean, we just go through everything and uh, really help people to really, really understand it. And then, you know, quite a lot of those people end up building structures and mm-hmm. uh, raising money and making substantial uh, sums of money, which is really uh, amazing. It's, it's a really exciting thing. And, and you know, and, and, and I don't think of myself as a teacher. I think of myself, uh, you know, once people come in there, we're, we're just peers. We're all peers. We're all, all of us are running funds together and we're all doing the same thing. Well, and that's the beauty that I loved it with, with Zoom. Um, you, you break it down over several, you know, five, six weeks. You got your, you bring your attorney on. He spends a session going through things. You, what was really eye opening is the, honestly, is the manual you've put together. It's such a huge resource, yeah. especially for people how help, help uh, ways to identify fee structures and how to structure the splits and the prefs and stuff like that. A lot of people get overwhelmed with it and you really break it down into, into digestible bite-sized tracks for everybody to take advantage of and learn how to do it. And it becomes a yeah. lot more, uh, I won't say accessible, but um, people walk away with a lot more confidence because you've broken it down that way because you've done so many of them and taken, you take the guesswork out of it. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're pretty good at it. And uh, I'd say based on our track record, you know, we put a thousand people through the symposium. A couple of hundred of them have uh, built structures. And, uh, you know, and a lot of those people have made an awful lot of dough. I mean, I mean, a lot you know, a lot. And, uh, you know, in Scottish, as you well know. So uh, hopefully if people uh, just text it in their number, they uh, get the resources, we'll send those things out. You'll be on our, our list. We'll send you videos. Uh, you know, if the symposium is for you, uh, if this is something that you want to learn how to do, we have a special offer for Note Camp. Uh, the program is $2,100. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly comprehensive program. And that's whether it's live or on Zoom, and we'll have to make that decision here coming up soon. Uh, for Note Camp, uh, we're doing two people for the price of one. Nice. So if you want to buy a ticket, you don't have to identify your second person right away. Uh, all you have to do is, um, you know, is just tell us that uh, you know you're you're buying your ticket. And we'll know. We'll hold on to uh, the second person. And if it turns out uh, that we end up doing it by Zoom instead, we'll probably uh, you know give some other additional bonus just to kind of uh, make it more exciting. But uh, it'll either be in Las Vegas or live. It just uh, sort of depends on a couple of factors. But, uh, you know, if you want to buy a ticket, and, and I would encourage you to do that, to take advantage of the deal, because Scott, fair, if it's only if it's okay with you. Yeah, go right ahead. That, that deal is for today. I mean, is today okay? Yeah, it's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, I know people are going to be listening to this uh, over the next week and they'll probably be calling or whatever. But, uh, you know, this this is for today, the day that you hear the program. Uh, so. You know, if uh, if you don't hear the program, I guess for a couple of days, maybe uh, maybe we'll be a little soft on it. But uh, go to, to go to uh, dealmakingsymposium.com, buy your ticket, and uh, and then send me an email to the email that this comes from, and uh, we'll hold a second spot. So twenty one hundred bucks uh, for a single ticket, and we'll throw in a second one for free. And 
uh, if you look at the, the website, that's a big savings. So, uh, what's the the time frame for some? Somebody asked a question here. I, hey, I've got a deal right now, and I need to start a fund. Uh, what's the kind no, of it, it takes? It takes a couple of months. So here's here's the way that works. When uh, when and, and Scott knows this because we're working on this now. But when we're building a uh, a fund, here's what happens: is I give you a link to my calendar. You can make as many appointments as you want. It's unlimited. And at the end of every appointment, I give you a homework. So if you uh, return the homework and then you make the next appointment for a day or two later, uh, we could be done with the part that with my part in a couple of weeks, and then we send it off the attorney and that takes, let's say a month. So it could be six to eight weeks. But if I give you an assignment and it takes you three weeks to turn it around, uh, you know, and, and that goes on for a long time, you know, then it could take uh, six to 12 months to build. So uh, really the, the timing is in your hands. Mm -hmm. And the more enthusiastic you are, the more efficient you are, the better uh, replier you are, uh, you know, this goes pretty fast. Question from somebody else. If I'm trying to raise a couple million dollars, do I have to raise it all before I can use it? Or can I use it in chunks as I raise? That, you know, if you're doing a syndication, which is a project, let's say you're going to buy an apartment building and the down payment is a million dollars, then you need to raise a million and a quarter to have a million dollars available for a down payment, right? Because you got to have a little bit left over. You're going to have some working capital. You may want to have some rehab money or whatever. Let's say you build a fund though, when you raise a million dollars and you go deploy 300,000, or let's say of the million dollars that you want to raise, you've raised 300,000, three or 400,000. Uh, once the fund is open, you can start spending the money. And then you can keep raising at the same time. So funds and syndications are a little different and funds are enormously more flexible, but sometimes a syndication is the right thing to do. And, you know, and again, that's something I help you figure out. You don't have to figure that out, but um, if you raise, if your goal is to raise uh, one, two or $3 million and you've raised three or 400,000, uh, once the, once the fund is, uh, once the money's there and open, uh, you know, and we usually set a little minimum floor, a couple hundred thousand dollar floor. You have to reach a certain goal before the fund opens. Once the fund opens, you can start spending that money uh, immediately. Another question here is, what's the typical cost for a fund to, to launch? You know what? Let's let's not uh, put that out here on this uh, okay. on a public thing because it'll you know it's uh, it turns out to be just a you know between one and two or 3% of the amount of money that you raise. I mean, we don't charge it that way, but it ends up being just a very small percent. And actually the part that people need to know is that you, the syndicator, do not pay for the fund to be built. The fund pays for the fund. Right, right. Now the fund doesn't exist right now. So you do have to advance a little money to get it going. But once the fund has some money in it, then you get reimbursed for whatever you paid. So you get it for free. So, you know, that, that's another uh, substantial advantage to, uh, to how this all works. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's a lot of people uh, don't know that. I think they look at it as being a right check and not getting, be able to get it. Yeah, it's, this is not an expense. You, you make a little advance, but then you get the money back, uh, you know, and it, it's part of your investment pool, you know, and then, uh, you know, you may use some of that money, that reimbursement to, uh, you know, keep buying stuff or you may buy stock in your own fund. I mean, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Question from somebody here is, what type of deals are you looking for? <laughs> well, you know, we were buying uh, distressed uh, real estate, distressed uh, residential real estate in the Midwest. Uh, we bought a pool of assets that uh, that didn't really work out well. If I had known uh, Scott earlier, I probably would have gone to him for some help, and I've, he's been helping me recently. So um, we are, uh, this particular fund is winding down because it's reached the end of its useful life. It's seven or eight years old. And we promised the investors that we'd be done in, uh, in about that time. So our fund is, is winding down. So we're not buying anything right this minute. But I'm probably going to start something new uh, not long from now. Thanks. Good stuff there. Any other questions for Mr. Joel here uh, on Note Camp for you guys out there for you? I, I, I love just like I said, I, I've been through this symposium twice. I love how you teach. I love how you put things together. It's it's real world knowledge. And that's, I think that's one of the biggest things uh, is having not only your the, the attorney side and your attorney is phenomenal, but the business side. I think there's a lot of people out there that just go to attorneys for PPMs and stuff like that. And they don't have the business side to kind of match it up and have it make sure it works effectively. Yeah, that's... Uh... And then what ends up happening is that they go try to raise their money and then people turn them down because the attorney made the terms too onerous. 
And, yeah. You know, the, the attorney's job is to advocate for you, but sometimes you can over advocate. And, and my job is to kind of make sure that you kind of balance, uh, you know, that the attorney makes it right, but not, not so terrible that nobody wants to invest because then the attorney wasn't successful either. So uh, there's kind of a balance and, 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 and I kind of help get all that stuff going, help you with the marketing material and all the other stuff. So you're successful raising your money. Yeah, that's totally the thing. And I, I like the fact too, that you're the way you, especially during symposium, you're role, giving everybody that's putting funds role-playing together for things, getting them to kind of have those initial conversations where they're talking with investors as well too. That's a valuable well, you know, thing. Think, you know, Scott, think about it like this, you know, so right now you go to people and you say, uh, you know, I'm uh, buying notes and uh, they say, yeah, that sounds very nice. Well, you know, it's like, you're just like blowing smoke. It's like they, they, there's no way for them to get involved with you. What if somebody said to you, uh, God, that, that note business really sounds exciting. I'd like to get involved. Well, sorry, I, I don't have any way for you to get involved. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's awesome being me getting to do notes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, but but all of a sudden when you have a, a thing like this, you say, well, you know, uh, I don't know if this be interesting to you, but, you know, we, we take investors and then we share the profits with those investors. Well, boy, I'd, I'd be interested in having to look at a deal like that. Now, some people are going to, when you say that to them, you know, when you uh, meet people at parties and wherever you go, some people are going to say, you know, I'm going to Milwaukee next week. You have any idea what the weather's going to be? Well, don't keep pounding on those people because those people are not investing in your deal. Right. They're, by the way, probably not investing in any deal, <laughs> you know, but, you know, so this just, you know, for, and for you, Scott, you know, you're talking to people about learning about notes. And then some people say, you know, notes sound fantastic, but yeah, maybe it's, uh, I'm kind of busy being a doctor or whatever right. I am, uh, but I've got 50 grand laying around. I mean, is there any other way I could, I could do something with you? Well, matter of fact, I've got, you can buy notes over here or you can put money in my fund and I'll do all the work and we'll share the profit. So imagine being in a position where you have so many more options. That's why guys make a lot of dough. Yep, yep exactly. Well, that's the thing is there's so much private money sitting out there. People don't know what to do with it. And I think we talked, uh, most of the self-directed IRA companies, they got people that put money in self-directed IRAs at accounts, but they never go do a deal themselves. You know, 30 to 50% of the funds at Rocket Dollar, Quest IRA, New View, Equitrust are making 0% because they're just sitting in an account, um, not having a deal or not, not having brave enough to pull the trigger themselves. And they're looking for investment deals, you know? Yeah. The great stuff there. Well, listen, uh, you know, I wonder if, um, you know, if people want to put in the chat that, uh, you know, if we should, uh, you know, put their name in pencil on our on our list. If you uh, have any interest in the symposium, just uh, just put the word yes. And, you know, and that way, uh, I, you know, I don't I don't know we're going to be calling you or anything, but I just uh, am interested to know if we uh, got through to anybody because uh, this could, you know, I, Scott, my goal is I hope we could change a couple of lives here. I mean, I mean, right. literally turn lives upside down. From, from good to, to rocket to the moon, you know, I mean, where it's, uh, you know, we could really do something that's awesome. So yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully people are going to, uh, going to see that. Yeah. Norman says, yes. If you're watching also on uh, YouTube there, feel free to type in the chat. Ross, you guys that are watching there. Yes. They're for you. Should so, you know what? So to... Scott, make sure you send them to a deal making symposium. Yep. Uh, dot com. Buy your ticket. And then, uh, then I'll reach out to you and, you know, and, and, and by the way, if you buy a ticket, I'll give you an hour of my time. We get a half an hour, whatever you want. I'll send you a link to my calendar. We'll talk um, and we'll, uh, we'll get to know each other. I want to understand what your objectives are, what you want to do. Uh, but you got to buy a ticket. You want to, you know, if you want to talk to me, you want to have some of my time. Happy, I'll give you as much time as you want. I don't charge by the hour. I mean, I really, uh, this business has been good to me. I'm kind of in a give back mode, uh, you know, but at the same time, uh, you have to join the family. And why does it cost anything? Because uh, otherwise, I'd have a bunch of looky loos that uh, you know just uh, waste all my time. Yeah, so, we don't. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, it just it's you know, and you'll you'll all understand that as you move along through your arrangements. But uh, you know what? You know, if you once you once you're in the family, you're in the family, and then we treat you pretty good. Amen to that. Of course, and of course, Scott doesn't invite me over for ribs. Uh, you know, I, I thought I was in the family. You know, you're in the family. It's just that you live in L.A. All uh, right. <laughs> Uh, good stuff, man. Well, definitely looking forward to splitting some ribs, having some time uh, to network with you and, and catch up on things. Guys, take advantage of the offer, dealmakingsymposium.com, two for one. 
it can be a, a life changing, not only income making and profit making, not only for you, but your family, your future in business in a nickel and diamond and onesie twosies. This is a take it to that next level. And we all want to level up in our real estate. So take advantage of it now, guys. Say yes, text in. Anything, text the, uh, once again, text uh, assets to 7200 out there, everybody. Take advantage of it, Seth. So, Joel, 70, thank you. 72,000. Sorry, 72,000. I said 200. That's right. The extra zero on there. Cool, bud. All right. Hey, man. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, if you need me, uh, you know, you want to talk about dough or anything else, just be in touch. Will do, brother. I got stuff coming to you. I got some homework this week to get to you, too. You, you do. You do. We'll Great be in stuff. touch. Sounds good, man. Thanks. Bye.